Life Audio. Welcome to Christian Natural Health with naturopathic Dr. Lauren DeVille. Christian Natural Health is the podcast on how to get and stay healthy God's way. You'll hear topics on nutrition, exercise, sleep, avoiding toxicity, meditating on scripture, what supplements to take, stress management, defeating anxiety and worry, how to reconcile Eastern medicine approaches with Christianity, and a whole lot more. Now, here's your host, Dr. Lauren. Get a quote at AAA.com slash insurance and save by bundling auto and home. Owning a business comes with pressure. There's a limit to what I can do and still keep employees engaged. Fortunately, there's Insperity. They put 30 plus years of HR experience to work to help me with hiring, training, HR administration, and compliance, while giving my employees competitive benefit options. And because I'm able to focus on other priorities, my employees can thrive and my business can grow. With Insperity, nothing seems impossible. Insperity, HR that makes a difference. Welcome back to another episode of Christian Natural Health. Today, I am very excited to have Dr. Nisha Winter with us. Dr. Nisha is a global healthcare authority and best-selling author in integrative cancer care and research consulting with physicians around the world. She has educated hundreds of professionals in the clinical use of mistletoe and has created robust educational programs for both healthcare institutions and the public on incorporating vetted integrative therapies in cancer care to enhance outcomes. Dr. Winters is currently focused on opening a comprehensive metabolic oncology hospital and research institute in the U.S. where the best that standard of care has to offer and the most advanced integrative therapies will be offered. This facility will be in a residential setting on a gorgeous campus against a backdrop of regenerative farming, EMF mitigation and retreat, as well as state-of-the-art medical technology and data collection and evaluation to improve patient outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Nisha. I'm so excited to have you here today. So excited. As we were getting ready to do the recording, you and I were already like, <laughs> much excited about this conversation with your followers. Love it. I was so right on the same wavelength. So first, like give our listeners a little bit of background on you and you've got this, this incredible cancer story of your own that kind of led you into integrative oncology. So tell us about that. Sure. You know, I think anyone who decides to jump into the work in the cancer arena, we didn't sit there and choose it because we thought this seems like a really good job. Like <laughs> you know, we didn't like, oh, I just feel really called to work. We, we've had a personal experience that usually draws us into this field, either directly impacted by it or, you know, from ourselves or a very, very close loved one, or just really watching people suffer with this um, condition. And so I'm no different than that. And I started out in the world with a lot of health issues. So wish I would have had access to a, a brain based practitioner uh, or an integrative naturopathic colleague, you know, way back in the day when I was dealing with all my health issues from basically birth up until the moment that I was diagnosed with terminal cancer, um, stage four ovarian cancer, end stage organ failure, um, just shy of my 20th birthday. The official diagnosis didn't come until just a few weeks after my 20th birthday, but I'd been in and out of the ER for months on end leading up to that. And it was just wrongfully, you know, diagnosed or mis misdiagnosed or missed in general, because I was like the, the zebra we talk about exactly. in medicine, you know, like yeah. in 1991, who's thinking that a 19 year old has stage four ovarian cancer, right? Exactly. Right? So we don't really blame, you know, that community for this because it, we'd miss it today, right? It's just, it's not what you're looking for. It's not what you would ever expect. And I had such a a chronic illness history that it was just expected like, oh, this is just your PCOS, or this is just your endometriosis, or this is just your IBS, or this is just your rheumatoid arthritis, or this is just your, so everyone just kind of kept putting it in the boxes that had already been sort of labeled for me. Sure. Yeah. At that time. Mm -hmm. And so that diagnosis was a giant, aha, uh -huh, wake up call for everybody involved, myself included. Um, and to be really uh, kind of just forthright with your, with your listeners, it came at a really uh, interesting time in my life because I was really questioning whether I should be here or not and had actually struggled with um, suicidal ideations and even attempted suicides in the years prior to my diagnosis. And so for me, it was such a blessing in that it was the ultimate sort of wake up call, the ultimate messenger, the ultimate like 
shake me awake to say, do you want to live? Here's your opportunity. You can have an exit strategy or you can choose to live. And for me, you know, I, I appreciate that there's people that cancer becomes their exit strategy that, you know, they, they may connect with, this is my time. But for me, it lit a pilot light that said, not my time. I got to figure out why a 19 year old would have this diagnosis wow. when it's so uncommon. And that's what I set out to do. I didn't set out to cure it or live. I just wanted to understand the why. And here I am 31 years later at the time of this recording um, with that terminal diagnosis, still learning the why for myself, as well as tens of thousands of patients globally. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing story. So considering this was 19, early 1990s, yeah. how did you come to get the information that you got in order to turn things around? Like, did you just figure this all out on your own or... Yep. Because in 1991, there was no Dr. Google. There was no, you know, uh, this is pre integrative medicine. We, you know, we started the department NIH was starting kind of quietly to, to start to create a department of um, alternative medicine is what they initially called it with NIH. And then it moved into CAM complementary and alternative medicine into the nineties. And then later in the two thousands, it evolved into the center of integrative medicine, which is sort of the, the moniker of today, right? Like that's how we think of it today. So this is early on before anybody was groovy in this field, right? Like it just it, out there, there were no influencers. There was no that Facebook pages of support. So I did, I had to really go it alone. I was pre-med. So I had a very inquisitive scientific mind and I started researching everything I could through the Dewey decimal system and on microfiche, cause that's what was wow. happening back in the night, <laughs> free internet, you know, like all oh, the yeah. things. And so I started learning, uh, different things along the way. And because I was so, so ill, um, one of the most fundamental things that happened accidentally, which you and your listeners understand that nothing happens accidentally. Um, you know, I feel very guided on this process, but, um, I was, I had a bowel blockage and so I couldn't eat anything. If I ate, it caused extreme excruciating pain that made me want to leave my body. Um, but it also made me very nauseous and it, I would throw things up. So I literally could not eat for two and a half months. And with my giant swollen ascites filled belly and my bowel obstruction and my organ failure, that was probably in hindsight, the best thing that could have ever happened. Yeah. And it was an accident, right? We now today in the modern eras, we can actually go back and look at work by people like Dr. Moreshi from 1909, showing that one of the biggest strategies to tumor debulk is actually fasting. So I accidentally fasted. I, I had definitely had my 40 days and beyond in the desert of my psychology of this process and my yeah. spirituality of this process. Um, and so that probably, that helped dry up a lot of the ascites, even though I had to have a few taps during that time. It helped me debulk some of the tumor to take some of the pressure off that was causing so much pain. It gave my digestive tract and my um, organs, my kidneys and my uh, liver to recover from some of the burden it was carrying. And then slowly and surely I started to learn other th tools. I started to bring on some acupuncture for my appetite and for my pain management. I started to work in a health food store to get access because I was very poor um, to have access to quality food and to supplements that I couldn't otherwise afford. So I basically take home whatever food they were going to throw away and was living on that. Um, I started, I had to do a two year family fast. I came from a lot of toxicity, a lot of abuse, a lot of trauma. Um, as I mentioned, came from a lot of poverty as well. And so I just needed to pull myself away and do some inner resourcing with these things. And so those pieces just bought me the time to keep, as I say, kicking the can down the road a little bit further. And each time I'd hit a certain milestone, I'd learn something new and I'd apply it to myself. And then I'd hit another spot and apply it to myself. And suddenly they told me I'd be dead in three to six months. Suddenly I'm past six months and I'm still here. No one knows why, especially me. <laughs> And, and uh, I stumbled across a book the day they told me that there was nothing they could do. I was pretty traumatized and ended up in the library and in two hours inhaled a book that just seemed to jump off the shelf to me called Quantum Healing by an unknown writer at that time, Deepak Chopra. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, this is back in the day. I switched my pre med degree from biology and chemistry to psychology and chemistry. And at that time, based my degree on a self constructed major of psychoneuroimmunology, based on the work of people like Candace Pert and Robert Ader and Bruce Lipton and others. Again, well, I, I was more drawn to that because I did start to understand the trauma body impact on this, yeah. as well as the toxicities that I was exposed to. I grew up 
literally today, if you type in my zip code of where I grew up, um, I was on four super fun sites within a few miles of four super fun sites, a big military and industry environment. Um, I was so poor. We lived on extremely processed sort of secondhand, you know, shopping at the cheap grocery stores and just like boxed thing and the pink meat that we called hamburger and stuff like that. Just all those things. Like I had no nourishment, um, in my body. And so I learned these things along the way of like how to like tweak one thing, tweak another, it didn't come overnight. It took me a good 10 years, I would say to get myself stable enough to, to, to start to trust that he actually might survive. And in that first year, within the end of my first year of being alive, I realized I was strong enough and healthy enough, still with no promise of my future, that I thought I'm going to go live my bucket life, my bucket list, because I'll be dead. You know, I was believed because that was the belief system that was fed to me. I took off on seven months of traveling throughout Europe and in doing so in the Middle East and India and all these places and started stumbling across different healing modalities, things above and beyond what I was learning in my pre-med courses and thought I was going to go to standard of care medical school and started learning about these other options and opportunities. And it just really, every little place was like another little egg in my basket of another little treasure that I stumbled upon that just helped bring me to where I am now 31 years out. And so applying it to myself first, right. getting into some really amazing educational programs, such as the naturopathic education, my doctorate in Chinese medicine, spent 13 years studying Ayurveda, mm-hmm. uh, lived and worked on a in uh, indigenous communities and worked with kind of the shamans and the the indigenous practices of those communities, learning from different healers and healing modalities from all over the world. All of those things informed me as well as my experience in working in standard of care. I was a CNA all through my college years, a certified nursing assistant. I worked in an Alzheimer's unit. I learned, you know, all of the things in kind of general medicine. I worked in hospital settings. I worked in HIV hospitals and clinics. I learned so much through my education that standard of care informed my knowledge knowledge as much as alternative. And I really realized that I couldn't separate the two for me, it needed to be both. So that's where we are today. That's amazing. So I, as you're telling your story, I'm imagining this should be like a documentary movie. <laughs> awesome. Someday my Hallmark TV show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, just so incredible. And I mean, almost as if, you know, if you could show what's happening in the spiritual world on the other side is you're being led to all of the various things that ended up moving on to the next step. I just love it. That's so good. Goosebumps, just you even saying that. And I've definitely had, you know, those experiences that there was, I've had a lot of help, a lot of, a lot of support along okay. the way. That's yeah. beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. So having gone through like alternative and traditional and all of the rest of it, what is your perspective on the Western like oncology model in general? Yeah. So, you know, in general, we've, it's, it, it Western oncology is very, very expert at the tumor. Uh-huh. They, they know everything there is to know about a tumor, a tumor cell, a tumor pathway, and they're hyper focused on that. And they're like, ah, I got this. And so they're always focused on that. Right. What they forget is that there is an entire organism, living, breathing, dynamic organism wrapped around that tumor, wrapped around those tumor cells, wrapped around those tumor metabolic pathways. Mm-hmm. And that is the part that they don't have training in, that they don't have expertise in. And so they either don't know and, and will admit it, or they don't know. And will just say, this stuff is cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Please don't do it. Or they're really resistant to even recognizing that there's something more. And so you get a mixture of, so I guess, reception, depending on where people are in their own belief systems within that environment. Sure. Yeah. 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 And in my career, I've watched this field go from extremely like, Nope, you're crazy. Uh-huh. crazy. Get out of my face to all right, you're not causing harm, but you're likely not doing anything either. And now it's moving into this realm of, wow, you might be onto something. Now the re- the things you've been saying for 30 years, the research is now catching up to it. And isn't it interesting how long that process takes? <laughs> I never in a million years thought I would live to see what I'm seeing in the last two years. Things are beginning to shift. Yeah. yeah it's exciting. Absolutely. So you have this amazing book on integrative oncology. And one of the things that really struck me in that was what you kind of described as the, the mitochondrial component. So tell us a little bit, give us a brief overview for the listeners who might not remember what are mitochondria and how does this apply to cancer? (laughs) 
<laughs> Let's back it up a tiny bit before that, though, because in 1914, Dr. Theodore Bovary coined the concept of the somatic mutation theory of cancer, which is the idea that cancer is just a, a genetic hiccup, accumulation of genetic uh, assaults that are um, basically just bad luck. All right. That's the drum beat. We've been, you know, the, the beat of the drum we've been moving through for ever since. So well over a hundred years, that's also what's informed all of our standard of care research models. We are, again, it takes us back to the tumor, but to the tumor, very specifically, this is a genetic disease that cancer is a genetic disease. But what's been interesting is even the American cancer society says, uh, cancer is a genetic disease. However, 95% of the time, those genetics are based on the diet and lifestyle that in, imposes their, the genetic sort of expression. Okay. Sure. So it's like, how can it be both ways? And so all of our research dollars keep going in, like after the gene, once we got the genome mapped, we thought this is going to be it. We're going to have the answers. And it's like, nope, we didn't. We got further. It's almost like the more we learn, the more we don't know, right. which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. 1920, crazy old re uh, researcher, Dr. Otto Warburg came along and said, I'm noticing something here. That's not at the genetic level. It's at the pre-genetic level. It's at what is above the gene, uh -huh. which is what's happening at this fundamental. So we have, we have our cells and within those cells, we have this cytoplasmic jelly. Okay. It's like this, it's like this, it's like the, the water in the swimming pool and then floating little floaties in that swimming pool are what we call organelles. So like little cell organs and they they do have a lot of different properties, but one of the organs that's in there is the mitochondria. And if you had like sixth grade biology, you probably only thing you ever learned was probably the mitochondria, they make our ATP and that's our energy. And then we kind of bury that data and move on in life. So Dr. Um, Warburg was noticing though, that at that level, that the mitochondrion in cancer cells was very different than the mitochondrion in healthy cells. And he started to recognize that there was a, a process in the cancer cells where the mitochondria became more uh, wanting to uh, um, suck up glucose, suck up, you know, sugar than the healthy cells. And so it would basically starve out the healthy cells to feed itself until basically it succumbed. That research was really prominent until the 1950s when Watson and Crick came on and found the DNA. Oh, wow. Right? That was our approach in cancer. We were on the path of metabolic yeah. theory of cancer. But then Watson and Crick came along and basically took us off that path and pushed us down the DNA problem all over again. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to 2011, when Dr. Thomas Seafried's book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disorder, it's like he dusted off the old data mm -hmm. of Warburg, brought it back to our, even though people like Dr. Mina Bissell was researching it and talking about the importance of the extracellular matrix, basically the cytoplasm and the behavior of the mitochondria and whatnot. Back in the eighties and other people came along doing it as well. His work really started to change the narrative, mm -hmm. starting to show us that really cancer is a metabolic disease. So it's when the mitochondria, which are those, yes, they are our production of ATP, but it's more so about a general energy exchange and a general response that your mitochondria are little signaling. They, they take in all the data that's coming through, whether, you know, what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're thinking, interestingly enough, impacts the energy pathways within that cell. So that's where the psychoneuroimmunology really plays, plays a role here, but also what, what it's being exposed to the toxins in the environment, the pharmaceuticals, things that basically make that mitochondria suffocate and shift metabolically into a deranged cancering pathway versus keeping it on track because our mitochondria, when they're healthy, when they're functioning well, they're the cleanup system too. They're directly in charge of our, of a apoptosis programmed cell death. So basically when a cell gets a little, eh. <laughs> uh -huh. you like that? That was a really good, if the one's listening, like, what did she just do? <laughs> cleanup system. It recognizes, boy, this cell isn't working well anymore. And when you have a cell that's not working well, it could signal more damage and it could start to signal DNA breakdown, DNA damage. Mm -hmm. And so when your mitochondria are doing their job, they, they, they self-regulate. Right. 
But when that metabolic shift happens because of the way we're eating or thinking or the stressors or the chemicals or the, you know, the numerous drops in the bucket, we'll talk about here in a moment that affect its behavior, its quantity, its quality, Mm -hmm. its activity, Mm -hmm. then it shifts into this deranged state that is very difficult to correct without certain interventions. And ironically, most of the therapies today are based on this DNA damage, you know, because we're still trying to go after the D, the gene is the problem. And those therapies ironically make the mitochondria suffer more. So it's, it's hard to poison a body back into health. And it's not even to say that chemo is bad, but it should be used differently in the context of what we've now learned. And so the metabolic approach has starting to really overtake the genetic approach. And they're understanding that really what's happening at that metabolic level is what's driving the genetic level. And then one last piece to this, which is very interesting is how we started, like how we're still promoting this as a genetic disease is really beyond me because we've been able to do what's known as um, cell nuclear cell transfer studies. So when we talked about that cytoplasmic swimming pool and the little organelles floating around, you have your mitochondria and all these other little organs, but you also have this big organ that kind of looks like a big sunshine or a big moon, which is your nuclei, which is where your DNA is stored. That is the DNA information. That's the genome right there. Right. If you take, if this is a genetic disease as Bovary and the entire medical system has theorized that it is, if you took a cancerous nuclei Mm -hmm. out of a cell and you took out and replaced the nuclei of a healthy cell, theoretically, you should turn that into a cancer cell Mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. Never, ever happened after gajillions of experiments all over the world coming up with the same results, scratching your head saying, this can't be a genetic disease exactly. at all, at all. Yeah. And that's where everyone's like, we can still talk about genes. Genes are still important, but it, you have to go upstream, mm-hmm. which is to that level of the mitochondrial metabolic function. Absolutely. And so kind of hand in hand with the idea of the medic- uh, the, the dysfunction of the mitochondria over time, we've seen the cancer risks explode since 1940 and the world is also simultaneously, you know, correlation possibly, um, getting dramatic. <laughs> so what are those statistics? Like wh- how are things going in the wrong direction in terms of risk factors? Sure. That's such a good question. I mean, three major things have happened in the last 150 years. Once we moved into the um, industrial food revolution, we went from an average of five pounds of sugar per person per year to about 145, 175 pounds of sugar per person per year, which right there gunks up the mitochondrial machine. Okay. Like that alone was plenty. Right. The other thing is we had world war two. World war two is, I mean, wow. You know, it, it impacted every being on the planet, but what happened at the end of that is we had an amazing excess Mm -hmm. of ammunition Mm -hmm. and we're like, Hmm, what do we do with that? And some smart person behind a desk said, let's turn it into pharmaceuticals and agriculture. (laughs) Wait, what? I didn't know. Yeah. So we took all of our ammo and all those things and we made nitrate, nit, you know, nitrates for, for, um, fertilization, fertil- fertilizer for our crops. Sure. And we took the, um, you know, like the, like the, for instance, like the mustard gas is what became later became chemotherapy and many of these things. So we're like, where do we put all this stuff? Where do we put all these things that were, you know, basically, <laughs> acts of killing. Right. And let's put it into the thing that's supposed to nourish us and recover us, like heal us. Right. (laughs) And so, hmm. so we've changed drastically. Those, the other two things is that we now have had well over 80,000 new chemicals um, presented to our bodies, to our planet since the 1960s that have never existed beforehand. And we've never, we might have studied about, and this is not my statistic. This is the world statistics. We've studied less than 500 of them. Well, so we don't even know the mess and we don't even know how they interact with each other. I mean, we know, but we don't know. And then, so that's really a frightening endeavor. And then the other thing is, is just how we've changed our food practices. So now we do, we monocropped the planet. We used to have massive plant diversity. We used to have massive soil. We didn't till. When you start to till, you actually break up the micro, the mycorrhiza. You, you break up the microbiome of the earth. You, you break that up and you actually diminish the nutrients. We've dropped our nutrition from over 50% from the foods we eat today. And then let's just even start talking about the chemical, um, chemical 
utilization of our food from our plants that are being ubiquitously sprayed with, or just rained on from, you know, glyphosate soaked rainwater to our animals that are now being put in little factories and never to see the light of day to eat food that is not in their genetic match, which is clearly not in our genetic match. And then the antibiotics and the hormones that we're pumping it up to get our, you know, to get our return on investment dealt with here. It's a doozy, right? And so those are the things that have changed and folks are like beating up the wrong players. They're like, oh, it's meat that's killing the planet. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> or they're like, oh, it's, you know, they're trying to, everyone's trying to like get very dogmatic. For and one and, little thing, right. A collection of things. We've changed a lot of things in a very short period of time. And now we're all swimming. It's no longer a matter of if you're toxic, it's how bad is it? And how does it interplay with your own epigenetics, your own expression of your genes? Because we all have different, we're like, I have our own little blueprint, each of us. And so some of us, like my husband loves the smell of gasoline. Like he loves it. It's weird. It's a weird pathology. He's got super fast glutathione processes. He can take that stuff, put it in and excrete it out. I get a waft of it. I got a headache. I'm nauseous. My body doesn't have the ability to process that stuff. So it comes in and it just poisons me directly. We all have a different sort of baseline. And so some of us have more resilience than others. And some of us have less resilience than others and nary the two shall meet. And so that's where we've gotten is, is even be able to critique and analyze where each person is to help to also best support and serve them. So that's why when we're just saying, Hey, everyone who's got stage two breast cancer gets this treatment. They don't realize that there's massive outliers on either side of that bell-shaped curve that maybe 20% have a nice response. And that's what we're basing our research on. And that's what we're basing our treatment on, but they forget about the outliers that will either have no response right. or a horrible response. And that's what I'm interested in is like, let's look at those outliers and let's see what makes them tick. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, when I first started naturopathic school during the first like intensive weekend, um, it was Dr. James Sensenick who did this, I know, um, who, who I, there's this one analogy that's always stuck with me. And he says, if you want to get rid of mosquitoes from a swamp, there's two ways that you can go about it. You can either kill each individual mosquito or you can drain and aerate the swamp and the mosquitoes will leave. And Nailed it. Yeah. We've I've been swatting and spraying mosquitoes in all fields of medicine for far too long. And it's time to literally drain the swamp and, and clean it out. And I, I've seen this analogy played out as the fishbowl, you know, analogy of like, you don't, you don't like kill, you don't like add poison to the water for the fish, you take the fish out, you clean it up, you put the fish back in and bada bing, bada boom, you've got health. And Dr. Sensenig, bless his soul. This man was such an integral part of my own way of thinking and the health word. I love that he touched your life as well. Yeah. Um, really saw it from that terrain centric. Exactly. Place. exactly. The Samsung Neo QLED 8K TV featuring incredible color volume with 8K AI upscaling powered by 20 neural networks on an impossibly slim screen is the kind of TV that's so visually astounding, so unfathomably well designed, it has to be seen to be believed. Don't believe me? Well, okay then. Radio has its limits. Samsung Neo QLED 8K. Unreasonably good. Oh, I hate turkey hunting. I'm freezing. Me too. It feels like 25 below. 25? Did you know you can get up to 25% off grocery store prices at BJ's Wholesale Club? Up to 25% off? BJ sounds perfect for Thanksgiving shopping. They have really good turkey prices too. Then what are we freezing our bleeps off out here for? Let's go to BJ's. Get a Butterball Whole Turkey for just 99 cents a pound in club or BJ's.com. BJ's. <laughs> Absurdly simple savings. Exactly. Yeah, sure. So, all right, back to the diet, which was the first part that you discussed. Yeah, so yeah. You spend a lot of time in your book and I'm sure with your patients trying to focus on this and what to change. And so there's a lot of, you know, advice out there for people sure. who have cancer, uh, for what to change. What is your favorite dietary approach? Love it. You know, this is another place that gets very dogmatic. And I always tell people, first of all, there is no one diet, right? 
can exist, but we, and we can really individualize by looking at people's labs, looking at their current condition, looking at their current terrain, but we can also look at their epigenetics and see how they're eating to their, ep, to their genetic match, you know? So those are the places that we don't have to guess anymore with regards to probably what is the best way to go about this? Well, guess what? We've got the data to help determine it for you. And then we start experimenting with that. But let's talk about the fundamentals. What is common denominator across all areas of nutritional advice in cancer mm -hmm. is that plants should be at the base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. High quality, clean, organic, especially avoiding of the, of the, what they call the dirty 30 used to be the dirty dozen, but unfortunately oh, we 30 now. It's the dirty 30. <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez. Right. Right. It's like, take a look there, how much more toxic the world is. getting, it's, And it's not going away, you know, but the dirty, at least if people even start with the dirty, dir the dirty dozen, they're still doing improvement. Mm -hmm. We actually have lots of cool studies about people just avoiding the dirty dozen. They get a baseline lab test on their pesticides residues, and then they go dirty, you know, um, dirty dozen free for a month. The retest drops significantly our pesticide burden. So it's not hard to change this to support the body. So if we take it a little bit further, maybe get into the dirty 30 avoidance that might give us a little extra room to evaluate. But what we see here is across the board, that a good, you know, clean, dense plant. I love Dr. Terry Wall's ideology of the three, the, cup, the three and three. So, you know, three leafy greens, three cruciferous, three colorful vegetables. That's my root. The base for my patients is like three or nine to 15 servings of vegetables a day. That's my base camp for people. Yeah. And everyone's like, wow, is it keto? I'm like, yeah. Cause I think people think keto is going to be all protein. That's, that's the old Atkins, um, you know, side, we're not anywhere near that. So you've got to get the clean 15. Everyone can agree on that. Mm -hmm. At this point, everyone can agree that you need to be low carb. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Yeah. When we know that over 90% of cancers are very glycolytic, meaning that they're sugar hogs, everyone. And given that less than 6.8% of Americans are metabolically healthy, mm -hmm. um, her studies from Tra uh, 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 Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and a study that came out put by the American Heart Association this summer, July, 2022, um, we started out at 12% uh, pre-COVID, we're now at 6.8% of us are metabolically healthy. So that means that there are patients walking around with, you know, the, the Dunlap syndrome, so the waist to hip ratio is not as it should be. We're dealing with people with uh, chronic cholesterol issues, which everyone blames the fat, but it's actually a sugar problem. Okay. Everyone's blaming. And then we look at their blood sugar issues and everyone's saying, oh, you're fine. If you're at hundred, no, you're not. You're already having problems. If you're rising above 80 on your fasting blood sugar. Um, and then you're looking at people's um, just endurance, like what kind of stamina, what kind of exercise are they doing? If people are fatigued, that's the first signs of mitochondrial dysfunction. So, and then if their blood pressure is elevated, that's showing issues around stress response. That's showing issues around elasticity and response and the vasculature itself, um, and just oxygenation and perfusion of the tissues. And so those are all markers of metabolic health. And all of those should be achieved without pharmaceutical intervention. Mm -hmm. wow. So what these studies are showing is that only 6.8% of the American population fits that bill of those scenarios I just painted out, mm -hmm. which means all of us need to go low carb. And what's ironic is what we say low carb today in 1850, it was normal carb. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just compared to all the junk that's out there now. hundred yeah. percent. So crazy. So when, you know, like five pounds of sugar per year, it's like, of course we're all metabolically broken. So wow. no one thinks they eat sugar until I have them start to do like macronutrient counters. Wow. And then they realize that the heart healthy American um, heart cardiovascular association recommendations, even the, the diabetes association recommendations for your healthy breakfast, I that's still... three days worth of sugar at breakfast. Yes. Right. So your honey oats, first of all, drenched in glyphosate with your low fat milk, which when you take the fat out, you increase sugar to make it taste better. And then they have their orange juice, which is just one giant sugar bomb and maybe banana or raisins on it, which is just sugar on sugar on sugar. Wow. Suddenly you realize that you only had sugar for breakfast and right. no one thinks about that. They don't think about fruit. They don't think about grains. They don't think about flour products. They don't think about tubers. They don't think about those things that are just giant sugar bombs for folks. Mm -hmm. So that's the piece here that low carb, that's pretty much where at that point is where we kind of diverge uh -huh. okay. because this is where you start to realize we're so metabolically broken. We were all born as hybrid engines where we should easily and readily um, burn fats 
or sugar, but we've all had like the brick on the sugar burning pace, um, you know, pedal for so long, our body has forgotten how to deal with the other form. And so our bodies were never supposed to be feasting 24, seven, 365, right? We were built to be able to tolerate times of feast and famine. We literally panic now if we can't eat something every four hours, right? And so we've broken ourselves so much that our, we don't know how to get into there. We've all become so metabolically broken that we have to push a little bit harder to get us back to that divinely created hybrid system that we were all made to do, all made to be. Fasting, right? Yep, fasting. Or so there are multiple roads to Rome to create a state of physiologic ketosis. First of all, we're all born in ketosis, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Um, and then like, and then we kind of, if you live on the planet, yeah, quickly get out of it once they start to pump you full of everything else. But really there are multiple ways to get to a state of metabolic flexibility, which is you can do it by a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. You can do it by just a low carbohydrate diet. You can even do it as a um, carnivore diet. You can do it with exogenous ketones and you can do it with various forms of fasting. So there's no one right way, but when you are eating, And at the timing in which you're eating, you need to be looking at a new model of your food pyramid, which is plants, plants first, fat second, protein as a condiment. Mm -hmm. And then depending on your metabolic flexibility, you may be able to tolerate a little bit of stevia or a little bit of monk fruit, a little bit of um, dark skinned, organic dark skin berries or a, a little organic green apple. Okay. But until you're metabolically flexible, you don't really get those right. either yeah. until you push yourself back into nature's state for you. And then what happens is you become metabolically flexible. You kind of easily switch in and out that you should just naturally, when you go to bed at night, 13 hours later, you should be in ketosis. Sure. That's metabolic health. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so what's even intriguing to me is a study came out from MD Anderson several years ago, showing that women who'd had breast cancer. Mm-hmm. If they fasted 13 hours or more every night, so basically finishing dinner at 6 PM and not breaking fast till after 7 AM, mm-hmm. they had a seven zero, a 70% reduction in breast cancer recurrence than their counterparts who basically ate ad libum. Oh, wow. That's amazing. They, they didn't even ask what these ladies ate during the day. They could have been eating Twinkies. So we're learning that even the timing is big. And so think about ourselves just from not too long ago, the, the incandescent light bulb has not been around that long. You guys, a couple, your great grandparents will remember before this time typically. Right. And so when now we can basically eat and work around the clock, thanks to false light, we've messed with our circadian rhythm. We've messed with our metabolic health, blue light screen exposures, kick up your glucose and insulin levels. So even if you're eating perfect, but you're sitting in front of a blue screen at 3.00 AM, you are messing <laughs> with your health, right? Uh-huh. So this is really big. We can watch the insulin levels go up, the insulin growth factor levels go up, which are major drivers in the cancering process. And so our, our recent ancestors were basically eating between sunrise and sunset. So if you could even just simply get into the habit of eating only when the sun is up, you probably will do yourself a lot of good. Yeah. Not even worrying yet about what to take out of the diet. Then once you master that, then start to push yourself. See if you can handle 13 hours. Once you master that, see if you can handle 16 hours. Once you master that 18, 24, 36 on. And the rule of thumb I work my cancer patients into doing here is getting every day, 13 hours without fail. Mm -hmm. twice a week, pushing it a little bit harder with a 16 to 18 hour, Mm -hmm. depending on their cancer type and their chemo regimen, we will do usually a 24 hour fast once a week Mm -hmm. and then a three day water fast once a month. Mm -hmm. And then for folks for the long duration, people like Thomas Seafried and people like the longevity researcher, Dr. Walter Longo Mm -hmm. suggests a five to 10 day water fast twice a year could, could theoretically lower cancer risks by 70%. Amazing. It's right. Amazing. And it's free. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And you work up to it. And if you are someone who needs to jump in on, it, you want to have some medical guidance and support because we help people get there fast easily mm-hmm. um, with our supportive therapies. But man, everyone can get to this point. Even my type one diabetics, even my type two diabetics, we know how to get, you know, really extensive insulin dependent diabetics. Yeah. We can get folks there. And once they get there, we make them way more metabolically flexible. They're able to cut back their insulin. They're able to get completely off their insulin. We've even seen patients get off their insulin with type one diabetes, which I never wow possible. I've had 20 of those in my career. That's amazing. Shock. 
shock. Some people on insulin for over 18, 20 years. So it's not even like, oh, just the newly diagnosed. No, we've seen some pretty amazing things. And there's a couple of our colleagues who practice this and know exactly how to support someone through this process. So don't let the belief systems block you because truly anything's possible. We are far more powerful than we've been led to believe. Amen. Absolutely. I love that. So what would you say, I'm still on the diet sure, topic, sure, yep. to somebody who would say, okay, if you have cancer, then you have to be alkaline and you have to avoid all animal products. What's sure. your answer? Well, first of all, al- alkaline is not possible with a diet mm-hmm. and everyone thinks that it is. And yeah. the other irony is that the acidity that everyone thinks is the cause of cancer is actually the response to cancer. Mm, Wow. It comes after the fact the cancer is what acidifies the micro environment. Okay. Okay. And you cannot eat your way out of, I mean, if you're, if you're going to keep eating like really high omega sixes and really processed food, you're going to keep aggravating it. So that's what you want to avoid, but it's not like, Oh, more vegetables are going to fix this or no meat is going to fix this. That's not how it works. The only way you can really overcome alkaline acid issues is with pharmaceutical intervention. That's because the body is so beautifully set to, um, to homeostasis that if you take in something acidic, the body quickly makes it um, alkaline. If it takes in something alkaline, it quickly makes it acidic. It's constantly in that. And you can't have like, this is the beauty is like, it's divinely created for that. And the only way to really uh, uh, um, interrupt that is with pharmaceutical interventions. So there's that piece. And then the other piece around the meat, Mm -hmm. right? This is coming from a person who's a recovering vegan and a recovering vegetarian, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Early stage, and 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 so I really because that's all that there was back in 1991 is oh everyone should be on you know, a raw food vegan diet, and there's still people out there promoting this despite the fact that cancer patients can't have very very low um, magnesium, vitamin K, vitamin D, B12, vitamin A, zinc. Mm-hmm. And I'm missing one, but oh, uh, I think I, th- those are the main ones. So okay. we're missing those. Mm-hmm. And guess what? That's also the nutrients that are missing in our vegans and our vegetarian populations, okay. because those, most of those are derived from animal products. Mm-hmm. Yes. You can get a vegan vitamin D, but it's a vitamin D too. And it's not well absorbed. And for some people it's toxic. Wow. Yes. You can get carotenoids from vitamin A, but carotenoids are actually shown to proliferate cancer cells. So beta carotene is contraindicated in our cancering population, especially if people have a SNP called BCMO1 mm-hmm. and then things like B12. Everyone's like, well, you can get B12 from spirulina. What? Well, guess what? A lot of our cancer patients can't metabolize that either, especially if they have FUT2, TCN2, MTR, MTRR, MTHF1, you know, any of these SNPs that help that are difficult in absorbing their vitamin Bs. And then if they're taking the wrong form of vitamin B, it can actually make things worse in the methylation path pathways. So there's just a lot of variations that you have to dig a little bit deeper. And I tell people, I don't want to get in a dog the war with you about your diet. Let me look at your data. Let me look at your labs. Your labs will tell the truth because it is near impossible to get low enough carbohydrates on a vegetarian diet and virtually impossible on a vegan diet to where you're still like, yes, you can get the carbs, but you'll starve to death at the same time. You will not meet your needs of protein um, because protein in those environments are coming from legumes and, and um, grains, mm-hmm. both of which are lots of sugar. Right. So to get your protein needs to actually feed and support and to protect your DNA and to methylate and detoxify and to repair tissues and to keep you mentally on your game mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. requires enough protein. Yeah. Those diets, yes, you can get enough protein, but you also do so by getting a heck of a lot more carbohydrate to meet those needs. Cool. So strategically, there are experts that can help people who eat those ways for whatever reason find their, their way forward, but it is very difficult. It's much more challenging and they will still have to take an animal-based fish oil, vitamin D, vitamin K and B12 to actually be able to treat cancer for the long haul. And that's really hard for people to grok. That's really painful for them to hear. And again, not based on dogma, it's based on data, it's based on the reality. And so we can see that. So I tell people, if you're stuck or really attached to a particular diet, let's see how it's actually working for you. We can look at your epigenetics. We can look at your labs. We can look at your tumor process and see how things are doing. So that's what we're looking at is a plant dense, you know, high quality fat, a little bit of protein based on the patient's needs. And that protein can come from eggs. If you're a vegetarian, um, you know, or, 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 or good quality dairy products, but it can also come from, you know, if you have the right genetics, it can come from really good quality grass fed and grass finished beef. 
Mm-hmm. Right? And so that's the other piece here. When we are looking at animal products, whether you're a vegetarian or an omnivore, it must be quality because you do not want to eat a super fun site. It's really key. So I would rather people when they're out to eat and they can't find something else, I'd rather you go the vegetarian route if you're not sure of the source. Right. Which usually if you're eating out, it's going to be agriculture industry. Exactly. Right. And so here's the bummer too, though, is my vegans, vegetarians have the highest rates of glyphosate mm-hmm. because of course. Brain yeah. booms, of course they sequester the glyphosate. And so this is a known carcinogen. Right. Oh. And so this is the places you can't, it's, it's, this is what we've done to the planet. It's not the food's fault. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, it's not those. Like, so we have to remember that. And then the top notch here is, is like to, again, a little smattering of sweetness, but we really want to push people back to looking for sweetness in their life and other ways versus seeking it out in food. And that's, you know, a lot of us are self-soothing on the planet today with carbohydrates. We have a lot of derangements in our serotonin pathways in our melatonin pathways and in our dopamine pathways. And that's going to drive drive us to addictive behaviors and a lot of sort of justifications of why we're like, but I feel better when I eat carbs. Well, that's probably a clue that your microbiome is a mess, that you got dopamine issues. Da, da, da. And so then when we start to nourish the body properly, those right. things balance out. And so it's really fun to watch people, mm-hmm. um, kind of like reveal the truth of themselves to themselves by going on this journey as we evaluate their data to find the best match for them. And then everything seems to align their mood, their digestion, their metabolic health, their anti-tumor express, you know, response, all of the things seem to come into alignment. Awesome. And I love that diet is your foundation and trying to get your environment clean as much as possible. So on top of that, do you have any supplements that you like to recommend is for most patients? Yeah. And I think we kind of talked about some of the big ones that are typically low. So magnesium, a really big one, because you just don't get it in your soil anymore in your food. Even if you're a big eating vegan, lots and lots of veggies, all the things, even with our nine to 15 servings a day of vegetables that we would promote with our diet. Um, this is really still very deficient. So you likely need a magnesium supplement. Vitamin D is also a critical one, unless you are out, you know, exposing most of your body to the sun, um, you know, for 30 to 40 minutes a day, every day, um, and not putting stuff on your skin that blocks it. So interestingly enough, sunscreen blocks your vitamin D formation Mm -hmm. because it blocks UVB rays. And that's where you get your vitamin D is from the UVB. So that's why most of us are walking around deficient because we're terrified of the sun and we are out there leaking. Right. lube up and avoid it more. So mm-hmm. more than 70% of the population is drastically vitamin D deficient. So that would be a big one. Um, I also am really a, a fan in active cancering of higher dose melatonin. But again, I would have a physician help guide that because it can reset circadian rhythm. It can modulate hormones, can act as a natural aromatase inhibitor or selective estrogen receptor modifier. Mm-hmm. Um, it's naturally anti-angiogenic. It's naturally uh, um, redox balancing. So antioxidant with the balancing of that system. So it has a lot of utility. And again, thanks to our, our lovely changes in light mm-hmm. circadian rhythm, it really does help us, um, get things in order. Mm-hmm. And then things like berberine mm-hmm. comes after like the microbiome repair, but also the blood sugar support and balance. Mm-hmm. And then one thing I wanted to circle back to around the diet is, you know, the, a lot of people think a ketogenic diet is high meat. Well, that is the old Atkins way, and it could definitely help people lose some weight, but also high meat in a patient with cancer aggravates something called mTOR, which will drive insulin growth factor, which will drive tumors even more. So when people read the data, like, oh, meat causes cancer. Well, the thing is, is too much protein, even in a vegetarian form can drive cancer. So you have to be careful. We actually use a lower amount. We use just enough to keep the body alive, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram without really pushing it. Whereas in a non-cancer patient, you might want double, if not triple of that, you know, to keep going. And so we'll repair a patient. We might need different levels of protein in repair. Like after surgery, we might bump it up to like 1.5 grams per, per kilogram. But this is really critical is that it is not a high protein diet mm-hmm. at all. And so you both need to watch your protein macros as well as your carbohydrate macros. And some of us can get into ketosis just by dropping our carb levels under 50 grams a day. Um, Some of us have to push a little bit harder to 20 grams a day or less. And then some with really, really resistant metabolic problems, such as certain like glioblastomas, for instance, may have to push their carbs for a while under five grams per day. That can be daunting for folks and often needs some medical guidance, some expert guidance in that arena. But back to the, the supplementation, I think one of the biggest supplements we talked about is the weaving in the intermittent fasting. 
Um, moon bathing, sunrise, sunset walks and exposures to reset your circadian rhythm, grounding, being as barefoot as possible. Um, if you live in a second story building or, you know, stories above the ground, get grounding mats in your house and in your bed to help you just recharge those mitochondrial batteries. Um, and our mitochondria are very receptive to light. So if you're putting in too much blue light, you're stimulating the wrongful pathways of the mitochondrial function that can push you into that aberrant metabolism we talked about, but if you're bringing in the right light at the right time, you can actually rebuild and replenish the mitochondrial health along the way as well. So light is medicine. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Just cool. everything that God placed in the natural world yeah. is regenerative. Yeah. And exactly. So naturally, so like we literally are made to be healthy and, and in accordance with nature. Mm -hmm. And so most of us have lost it. Most people get to ask what, what, what phase of the moon are we in? Mm -hmm. You know, do you know when equinox or solstice is? And most people look at you like, what, what is that? Because <laughs> Americans spend less than 15 minutes per day outside. Wow. Is that right? Yeah. That's terrifying to me. So nature deficit disorder is a thing. Sure. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I'm seeing all these studies that now that are coming out about forest bathing, like I've never <laughs> heard of that being a phrase, but yes, it's so regenerative. Right. And how funny that we have to like qualify it now and write a script for it when it was just what we did. <laughs> now we're like, I have to go to the woods. It's yeah. like, how funny. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So changing gears a little bit in terms of like screening, what is your perspective and your typical advice toward things like mammograms and colonoscopies and things like that? First of all, nothing about those are prevention. They're just screening. We call them prevention in our culture, but they're just screening mechanisms. Right. Women with uh, dense breast tissue, small breast tissue modified, whether they've had a biopsy, a lumpectomy, a chip, you know, a tag placed after a biopsy or breast um, augmentation are no longer candidates for mammograms. They really need to move into other things like ultrasounds, thermographies, and for gold standard, if they do have a history of cancer, breast MRI. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where we look there. And then with regards to colonoscopies, we now have some non non-invasive techniques like Cologuard and some of these others that you can do fecal testing um, beforehand that's less invasive. And then you can, but you still usually have to follow up. If something does come back positive, you kind of want to take a look in there, but we offer some alternatives to the radiation radiator fluid they give you to clean out your bowel. You can just high dose magnesium for a few days and wash it out with some magnesium instead. So you can uh, keep your microbiome intact. So mm -hmm. there are ways that we use this as tools of screening. They're not tools of prevention. Real prevention would look at what are your vitamin D levels? What are your markers of inflammation? What are your blood sugar levels? Those would be the places to start for true prevention and then course correct those before they become a problem. Yep. Absolutely. Love it. Okay. What have I not asked you that you want to make sure that you leave with our audience? I just want to make sure that the three most fundamental things for your health and well-being are that you're constantly inquiring about what brings you joy mm. or what are you grateful mm. and what did you come here to do? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That is something to constantly be evaluating for yourself because it will set the field, the, the, the environment in which you get well or get sick. And so I hope I can leave that with your, with your listeners, that that's something that I want them to kind of check in with periodically. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Love it. And where can people go to learn more about you? Please, please follow me at, um, Nasha at drnasha.com. That's my, that's my email. If you're like wanting to follow up with some of these questions, but mtih.org that stands for metabolic terrain Institute of health.org. This is all about our nonprofit. Um, the first and only in the world, nonprofit residential Mm -hmm. integrative oncology hospital and research institute that we're building in the southern part of arizona and so i'd love to share more about that with you maybe on a secondary call but have your folks start to follow us there we are doing some pretty amazing things out there in the desert um uh, working on regenerating the land to regenerate the body and to regenerate the soul so we our tagline is we're working on regeneration of the soil to the soul mm -hmm. and everything in between so we'd love for you to follow us there and see what we're up to awesome so, well, I will share those in the show notes and thank you, Dr. Nasha, so much. This has been fantastic. What an absolute, absolute honor to be with all of you, Dr. Lauren. So thank you so much. Thank you. Are you looking for a holistically minded healthcare practitioner who truly treats root cause rather than symptom suppression? 
Unfortunately, even in the alternative healing professions, this isn't a given. That's why I've created wholehealthdoctor.com, a resource to help connect patients to healthcare practitioners in their area who share a root cause philosophy. Alternatively, most of the practitioners listed also practice telehealth. So if there isn't anyone local to you, you can still find a great practitioner to help you regain optimal health. Go to wholehealthdoctor.com. That's whole healthdr.com, type in your location or just the specialty that you're looking for and find the practitioner who's right for you. Thanks for listening to Christian Natural Health. This show is run by you. So please write in with topic and guest suggestions for future shows. For more great content, subscribe to Dr. Lauren's blog at www.drlaurendeville.com or follow her on Facebook or Twitter at Dr. Lauren DeVille. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to share it with your friends and give us a five-star rating in iTunes. It really helps us to stand out so other people can discover great content as well. Have a great week and God bless you. The Samsung Neo QLED 8K TV featuring incredible color volume with 8K AI upscaling powered by 20 neural networks on an impossibly slim screen is the kind of TV that's so visually astounding, so unfathomably well designed, it has to be seen to be believed. Don't believe me? Well, okay then. Radio has its limits. Samsung Neo QLED 8K. Unreasonably good. Oh, I hate turkey hunting. I'm freezing. Me too. It feels like 25 below. 25? Did you know you can get up to 25% off grocery store prices at BJ's Wholesale Club? Up to 25% off? BJ sounds perfect for Thanksgiving shopping. They have really good turkey prices too. Then what are we freezing our bleeps off out here for? Let's go to BJ's. Get a Butterball Whole Turkey for just 99 cents a pound. In club or BJ's.com. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings.